Hello, and welcome again to another edition of The Open Road, a journey where we look at all things open source and open source community best practices. My name is Brian Proffitt. And I'm Rich Bowen. And today we're going to be continuing our discussion of diversity and inclusion and all of the various related topics that surround that in the open source world. We have three guests that you've seen in previous episodes. We're gonna start, we're gonna start with some comments by Griselda Cuevas. And uh, she is, as you will recall from previous episodes, the outgoing Vice President of Diversity and Inclusion at the Apache Software Foundation. In this portion, <laughs> we asked our guests what specific steps they would encourage open source projects to take to improve their inclusivity. And this is what Griselda had to say. Yes, uh, I'm, I'm glad that you asked that because I feel like the more we hear diversity and inclusion, the more we defaulted to, oh, she's a Latina woman, let's just hire her and we're gonna be more diverse and that solves the problem. And I think that what is often not seen is that me being Latina doesn't mean that I'm gonna wear like hula hoop um, earrings and I'm gonna put a lot of makeup and come to <laughs> and just be a bit more loud and I'm gonna tell you when you're wrong. It comes with a lot of these cultural attributes, right? Uh, we are raised to be considerate in nourishing and nurturing of everybody around us. Right, like I can also tell you that more than a Latina, I'm an older sister, which means you're always a role model, which you are worried about how your siblings are going to be raised, and you're always the one with the pressure of your parents uh, being like a good student and behave yourself in public, and you need to be, to be the one that sets the tone in the room. That brings more to the way I interact in a in a professional setting. And that is what determines whether I'm included or not. If you put me in a, ro in a room full of engineers who don't care about anyone, and I'm trying to, to be caring, that's gonna piss me off. And that's gonna kind of like make me not want to, to interact. But if we offer a little bit more insight around the cultural, or just being more aware that not everybody has the same way of interacting, speaking, or working, we can be, really living inclusion. Inclusion is not about like how you look and just putting, you know, a little bean in the rice. That's what we said in Latin America. It's about being mindful of new ideas and try to understand where they are come from. And this is very hard, right? And I, I, I remember this very vividly around a year ago when the Black Lives Matters um, movement started to be very present uh, in the US, mm -hmm. not everywhere. It wasn't the US, and we need to, to recall this. I wanted to make a public statement um, as the VP of Diversity and Inclusion for the Apache Software Foundation. One of the reasons why I didn't do it at the end was this. We need to understand that it's um, a moment happening in a single culture, and maybe somebody in another continent in another country won't have the right context to receive this well. Right? And, and I think like that is the inclusive part. It's the acknowledgement of a matter, an idea, a topic is really important for a group, but there's also other groups that might not have the context. And at that, at that time, I recognized that I didn't know how to strive the balance. So I decided just to offer support, but not in a, in a public platform, like the VP of Diversity of the Petrosol Foundation. I did not know how to handle that at the time. And the reason why was like, is this really inclusive from other context or other people who might not understand what's happening? And this, I think, is the point of inclusion. Inclusion is not only ensuring that the less represented people in the room get a seat on the table. It's more about reaching harmony with whoever is in the table and um, yeah, I, I was trying to see if I could get another analogy here, but maybe I'll, I'll say this and, and people can debate on this. It's not like we need, everybody needs to be silent so the person who's less represented can talk. It's more of a bit mindful 
on how the entire interaction works with the rest of the people in the table, right? If everybody uh, it's coming with a strong idea and it's supporting, uh, you know, like a common decision, it's also making the space to to maybe you know listen to opposition or a completely different point of view and accept it. And also accept it as a way like that doesn't mean that every single thing that a uh, less represented person in the room is going to sure. say needs to to happen. It needs to be acknowledged. So Griselda really uh, approaches this from a, a really fantastic point of view uh, for me because it resonates really well. It's not it's not a numbers game necessarily. It's not about the differences. It's how you can get the mindset of everybody who is at the table as she describes to kind of come together and work together with, you know, with whatever they're bringing to the table, their talent, their background, you know, their knowledge, whatever. Yeah. And the thing that I, the thing that I latched on to and what she's saying, and this resonated with, with uh, a completely separate interview that I was watching earlier today. It's the, the specific conscious acknowledgement that not everyone has the same shared experience that you do, that not everybody uh, grew up. So the example that was given in the, in the interview I was watching earlier today was a really trivial one. It was talking about being on a conference call and seeing the Brady Bunch view. Hmm. Not that that's at all culturally insensitive or anything, but most of your audience didn't grow up watching the Brady Bunch and have no idea what you're talking about. And so it's just being consciously, constantly aware that your audience grew up in a different way than you did, had different experiences, have different worldviews and, and different perspectives on things that you take for granted. Yeah. Well, and, and it's kind of funny because in, in our relationship, you and I, you know, you grew up in your early formative years in Kenya so there are a lot of <laughs> cultural references you and so, I don't understand about each other. Yeah. You know, and and if you look at, like on the surface, I say, oh, he's he lives in, you know, he lives in middle America. He, you know, and it's like, okay, we're about the same age. Um, no offense. But <laughs> you know, but it doesn't work like that. So you can't even go by surface things. That's um, right. With things like that. Yeah, and and you know, Grizz talked about that early in her comments about how you you can't simply look at her and make certain assumptions about her based on her visible identity. Mm -hmm. And sure, she grew up in Mexico, but she's lived so many other places since then, and she has experiences that are not reflected that just by by the assumptions you might have looking at her. Right. Exactly. So, yeah, it, and a lot of what she says, so you were talking about some video, you know, something you were watching earlier today, and I was, you know, participating um, in a psychological safety workshop, and there was quite a bit of what she was talking about that was, you know, coming out of that workshop as well. Like, how do we help people to be able to speak and, and feel like they're being heard at a table or you know a, a, or a meeting or whatever a gathering how do we do that that is that is a huge part of what is you know labeled as psychological safety and and i think that goes hand in hand with inclusivity and as she says it's not necessarily a diversity issue they're not one and the same they're they're connected but they're not the same thing so um, who do we have next well, so I think we should uh, listen to the comments for the same question to Clarence Clayton. Clarence is the Global Data Privacy Manager um, at Red Hat. And we posed the question about, hey, what are the specific steps you would do to improve inclusivity? And here's what he had to say. So what I think of best practices for, for onboarding, one thing that comes to mind is being okay with people not knowing everything not expecting somebody to be a kubernetes level 10 thought mm -hmm. leader 
to contribute to your project success and meeting people where they are. Everybody has skills, everybody has talents, their community projects have wide and vast needs that can be met by people. And I say this all the time as well, regardless of how many years of experience you have or how much a veteran you are, when you're new to something, there's always going to be an onboarding and ramping up period. So give people that, that opportunity. Come in, use it as a learning opportunity. Use it as an exposure and education opportunity and, and give people the, the tools and the knowledge that they need to contribute and, and be successful. Don't necessarily have to expect them to come out the gate with, you know, the the problem the, the, the solution is going to solve you know all the problems of the project immediately mm -hmm. but give them the keys to understand you know, how you all make decisions what the priorities and the the the, the goals of the community and the, the project actually are and you'll be surprised over time what people will be able to do when the, you know they feel empowered to do their best work and that it and it's okay to to contribute to ask questions that you know maybe you know would be seen as level one or like you know basic elementary rudimentary questions uh but there it's a learning opportunity and and that's you know what we need to embrace and 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 give people the opportunity to do more i should add that when we asked him that question, we had framed it a little bit around inclusivity and onboarding to a project. And that's why he led with that. But I do think though, in a broader sense, his points certainly apply to any kind of inclusivity. I think so. And there's there was a lot of wisdom there. Um, one, of, one of the things that his comments made me think about, he's talking about people coming in and you accepting that they don't know everything. Um, one of the one of the huge strengths of having a diverse community is in the fact that these people may not know everything about what you're doing, but everyone's an expert. I, I, I was I was um, reflecting on this over the past week about how everyone on your team is an expert in something that you are completely ignorant about. So. You, I mean, just just as completely off topic examples, you have somebody on your team who is an expert in cheese. And mm -hmm. I have somebody on my team who is an expert in counterterrorism. And these things have nothing to do with their actual jobs, right? But mm -hmm. but the point that I'm making here is that everyone has expertise in things that you know nothing about. And so being contemptuous about them because they don't know how to use a particular feature of of kubernetes or whatever is it's arrogant and missing the point because the, the diversity of your team is is just the the effectiveness of your team is enhanced by all of these strange expertises that people bring to the table it may not be cheese or terrorism but it's it's some expertise that's going to enhance your end product. And, and so you can't afford to be dismissive just because they don't know some esoteric thing. Right, exactly. And, and this raises the point too about potential barriers to inclusivity um, that, you know, if you're not deliberate about it, as Clarence suggests, you run into trouble really quickly because um, one of the things that's very, um, it's very subtle, but it comes out a lot is things like in jokes or group communication. Like, so you and I have some friends, we have our own, um, you know, group communication. So if I mention, you know, a tiger in Brussels, that will elicit a laugh that only you and I, and maybe one other or two <laughs> other people on the planet will understand. But if we're in a meeting, and yeah. you know, and we toss that out. There are going to be people in that room who do not understand. We may and not we'll have time to explain it. it. Yeah, you know, and things like that. And that's such a small, innocuous thing, 
But we, we all are guilty of doing that kind of thing all the time because we have these shared experiences, whether it's work or outside of work or whatever. And, and it makes people feel outside. Mm -hmm. And, and we as community managers, one of the things we have to do is try to, well, A, build shared experiences, one way of doing, getting around that, and B, try to be conscious about, you know, not doing that so much or, you know, be ready to explain it because sometimes they're really funny. But again, you have to build that shared experience as you go. Yeah. I also want to draw attention to one other thing that Clarence said. And that was, it, he, he said it almost in passing, but I think it's really central. And that is being very clear about what your project's goals are mm -hmm. and how you make decisions. And these two things are extremely closely tied. If, if you have a clearly defined purpose for your project, that informs how you, how you, uh, do tiebreakers you know if, if there are two proposals on the table then clearly stated goals and tenants around your project will will lead to one being the better solution even if they're technically equivalent and right. so clearly documenting those goals is is really crucial to helping new people get the sense of where conversations are going and why right Right, because you're basically leveling the playing field. Yeah. Yes, yeah, somebody's been in there, you know, months or years longer than you. But if if everybody's clear on the goal, then the playing field is leveled. No, that's an excellent point, and I'm glad you uh, you highlighted that as well. Um, so our third and final guest that we talked to around this particular topic is to Demetrius Cheatham, and she is the senior director of diversity, inclusion, and belonging strategy at github um and we talked to her about you know deliberate steps around inclusivity and her comments are pretty eye-opening i think during it you know this isn't even me thinking about it this is what maintainers said and this is what members of the open source community said they said that there were pretty much three things that would just make tremendous strides in helping open source projects be more inclusive the first community hospitality Welcoming people when they come to your community, whether it's through an email, a direct message, or actually what we hear works best is even a meeting. Even if it's a monthly meeting or a meetup where contributors can get FaceTime with the maintainers or community leaders. And I don't know if shameless plugs are allowed on this show, but I must say that Definitely. one of the best way Definitely. to set up automatic community hospitality notifications is through GitHub Actions. Like we have that feature as well. The second thing I would say is documentation 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 i'm telling you if i had a dollar for every time i had this come up since i've been doing this work i'd be writing a check to just about every open source project that needed it have clear documentation letting people know the goals of your community the structure how to contribute no matter their level of coding experience the communication protocol what to expect what's being prioritized what's not being prioritized it's almost like help them help you and the third as i mentioned before have a code of conduct mm -hmm. but rich and brian i can tell you that's actually baseline now most communities have a code of conduct it's actually the enforcement now and i must add to that point there are many within open source that said that we can't just rest on code of conducts as well we need to be proactive so that code of conduct violations don't even happen in the first place provide the training and education for contributors, making sure they understand, you know, things around unconscious bias, educating them around mental illness and stigmas, or ways to help contributors prioritize their well-being and prevent burnout. And there's so many other trainings that we could do. And those that I just mentioned, they're not necessarily in order. If I had to put them in order as, you know, a matter of how often I heard them, I say documentation, then community hospitality, and then that code of conduct enforcement. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. Well, codes of conduct, that is something that Rich and I see on a day-to-day -day level um, more than anything, because we interact with a lot of different communities inside and outside of Red Hat. Mm -hmm. And it's always very frustrating that code of conduct seems to also be a lightning rod for trouble where people are sort of like, 
well, we don't need blood, blah, blah, blah. And, and <laughs> you know, you, you, it, it can be frustrating to communicate that, yes, you do. Um, because even if you are the most civil human beings on the planet, and, and I would personally like to see that, um, <laughs> if there is a problem, you know, somebody has to have recourse. Um, and, and, and so to that, you know, I, I guess the question I have there is like, what would be like, how do we as community leaders get people to embrace this notion uh, of codes of conduct? Um, you know, on, on a tactical level, and that's sort of a follow-up. Yeah, I think what you are describing is actually the reason why All In exists now. It shouldn't just be the, the burden of the community leaders to help people understand why code of conducts are needed. So the more widespread we can have this conversation started, the companies in which, you know, our contributors work, if they work for a company, the schools in which people are coming from. Boot camp should be talking about this. We should be talking about this all the time at conferences. If you just keep hearing it over and over again, just like we keep hearing documentation over and over again, security over and over again, then it becomes more of something that's not silo, it's inherently part of the community, right? And so I know that's something that we heard from our users on GitHub that said that, you know, code of conduct, they should be placed right up there with the important documents, like the licenses and things of those natures, like in repositories. And that was a change that we made because we wanted people to understand that codes of conduct, again, that's the baseline, that's the norm, that's the foundation. And everybody should just start coming to expect it. But I think that if contributors and maintainers are trying, I mean, uh, maintainers and community leaders are trying to make that lift themselves, that's what's harder. This is a collective effort. Codes of conduct make open source better for everyone, not just one community or one project. So she talks a little bit about one of the points that we brought out before, which was uh, telegraphing your, your goals and your the way you make decisions. But uh, the, the other two things that she talks about, intentional, proactive hospitality mm -hmm. and code of conduct. To me, those two things are very closely tied together because one of the, you know, people who are in an existing community where a code of conduct is then introduced may feel like they're being uh, reprimanded maybe or being called out. But, but what I've seen more and more is that co a code of conduct is not so much a message to the people that are already there as it is a message to the people who are considering coming. It says, this is the kind of community that you're going to be joining. And, you know, I, I've heard a lot of people, particularly people in underrepresented groups, say that that's the first thing that they look for. They don't look for the, the technical documentation. They look to see, is there a code of conduct and will I be, will I find this a welcoming place? Right. And so it's an onboard. It's, it's actually, it, it's, a, it's a path to onboarding. And it's just so important for communities to have this. I agree. And 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 that's probably why I asked the follow-up question in the original interview. And and I will I will say it's not just the underrepresented people who are looking at codes of conduct. Um, we were involved with a, a study um, with the University of Nebraska Omaha and the University of Missouri, and they surveyed about 40 different organizations, which were at various ends of the spectrum on using and participating in open source communities. And one of the results that pleasantly surprised me was that a lot of those organizations, when they are looking at joining a project that, you know, for an open source, you know, technology that they want to use and start participating in, one of the things that they will look at is does that community have a code of conduct? And if it doesn't, they're very apt to lean away from it and go to someone else who does. So it's not just the underrepresented, and I'm certainly not minimizing that in any way, but corporations, they want to be ensured that these projects are as inclusive and diverse as they possibly can be. And the code of conduct is a huge signal when it's enforced properly of an inclusive community. It really is. It's 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 one of many signs that the community has taken sustainability 
and succession planning seriously. It's mm -hmm. not just it's not just me and my bros working on this. Mm -hmm. It is actually we've we've taken a serious look at what it means to welcome the next generation of our project. So yeah, I I, I definitely agree with that perspective. Yeah, and you bringing up succession planning is is kind of funny because I joked about our respective ages earlier, but you know we you know we're part of an older generation so to speak in open source. I'm sure like in technology land we're probably generation three, you know if you go way back, but we're getting there. And 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 I'm you know I'm more than ever cognizant of looking at the younger generation. And looking at the people that I work with and the people in the communities at these conferences and saying, you know, we need more younger faces here. And I'm not trying to be ageist, you know, but we need newer faces, whether they're young or old, let's put it that way. You know, we need to have more people coming in and not just the, the usual standbys, um, you know, because it, yeah. the future of open source and free software depends on it. And, you know, looping back around to inclusion and including those people in the conversation, a huge part of inclusion and, and, and indeed part of the definition of inclusion is that the people that are included feel ownership. And the only way that our program, that our projects are and will be sustainable 30 years from now is if that younger generation feels that they own it. Mm -hmm. and, and that that ensures that when the older generation is no longer involved, it doesn't just wither and die because the younger generation has felt included and has felt ownership. Exactly. And I think with that, I think we've uh, can, uh, wrapped up this part of the journey on the open road. Um, I'd like to thank my co-host, uh, Rich Bowen, for joining us today, and certainly our guests for delivering more insights around this topic of diversity and inclusion. Um, so until the next time, my name is Brian Proffitt. And I'm Rich Bowen, and thank you for joining us on The Open Road.